Hello again, and welcome to a financial thought leadership podcast, Banking on Experience, sponsored by CRM Next, the banking CRM, where we simplify work, drive growth, and deliver on experience. This podcast is meant to empower individuals working in the financial industry with stories, experiences, and knowledge straight from the source. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, and stay tuned for an awesome show. Welcome to another show of Banking on Experience. I'm your host, James Gilbert. Today, I'm joined by Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace happens to be the co-founder and president of Interview, which is a marketing consulting firm that helps companies align their brand and product stories with their customer-facing teams. At Interview, Chris and his team have developed the Breakthrough Brand Transfer Score, which I love and I can't wait to get into more of that. It helps companies measure brand message alignment and engage their frontline teams in innovative new ways. Chris, welcome to the show. James, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah, I know. When we when we first got on, I mean, two marketers coming together, it's just like, it's a wonderful thing, right? <laughs> I mean, we'll see I, if others think that way. Hopefully other people feel the same way too. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting for sure. Today's topic, it's about the bridge between brand and experience. So we're going to try to give you guys a little bit of flavor of what that looks like from our eyes, but also know that there's a vast realm of marketing and the experience world that exists out there. And we're trying to make sense of it in a quick, like 30 minute episode. So know that it can be pretty vast and there's a lot more out there. What do you think is the biggest misconception about experience in the financial world? Let's start there. The biggest misconception about experience. I would say, I think the biggest misconception is that the the digital realm, the online realm is the cornerstone of experience. Mm -hmm. Research shows and and CMOs are saying all the time that the investment they're making around experience is, is, you know, predominantly in the digital realm, right? It's it's, it's online tools and self-service and things like that. And I think that the misconception that that's the biggest driver is is probably wrong. I think that those are enabling factors, but I think that the the core of the experience is human. And I think that that banks, especially if they look to fend off the the fintechs and, and, and you know companies like that that are they're bringing a new experience to the table, I think uh, the the human connection still has to be the the backbone. So let's talk about how brand plays a role in that. The way I talk about brand and experience is this. Brand is the promise you're making to the customers. It's the, you come to know us for and expect that we will deliver this for you, right? This is what we're saying we can do for you, where we add value. And the experience is really the, the, the strategy and the, and the tools and the processes to make sure that you can deliver on that promise, right? So I think they're inextricably linked. I think that the brand is making the promise, the experience is keeping it. We think about some of the misconceptions around the, the link between those two is, you know, brand can often often be looked at as just words or just logos or just colors. And the reality is that, you know, the ultimately how the brand is going to be looked at increasingly over time is going to be linked to experience. What, what the perception customers have is going to be more about the experience really than it is about your products, more about, you know, really anything else, especially not about your logo. It's going to be about what they get when they show up. Do you know what I love most about this type of topic? I do not think that in, that doing it well is unique to s- certain industries. And what I mean by that is brand and experience done well can be adopted and the, and the practices that are adopted with that can be pretty much leveraged. Just about any industry can, can do it. Right. So I think that's one of the things that I love about this, because I've worked in a lot of different industries and found that the brand and experience side and making that cohesive has never been something that, oh, my gosh, we got to do it totally different for this industry versus this industry. There's obviously little nuances, but it's pretty universal on how to do this stuff. And what it boils down to ultimately in the centerpiece is you have to realize people on the other end of your brand are human and you've got to yeah. be human throughout the journey and you've got to treat those experiences wow moments. And we'll get into some of that in a little bit, but I mean, is that how you think about it as well, Chris? I really believe that the nuances are more by brand than they are by industry. I, I, I think the nuances are really defined by 
brands by their nature are built to be different, to stand for something other than what everybody else in their space, especially in the banking category, they're trying to stand for something different. We know some of the folks from TD, um, the, you know, local folks you know, here in the Philadelphia area where they have a, a lot of their operation here in, in, in the US. And we talked to those folks and they actually have a plan and a construct for how, how what they say is going to be different about them is operationalized throughout their entire organization and they deliver on it and the awards that they win are, are proof positive of the fact that it's working. But I, I really do believe it. it's not about the industry you're in, it's about who you wanna be as a brand and making sure that the nuances are accounted for in your experience back to your brand, not to your industry. So let's talk a little bit about how you measure this. What do you think the foundational steps that you know a financial institution can take to, to measure experience? So we're working with a, a bank right now, a community bank in the, in the greater Philadelphia area who is, is, is getting into the net promoter score game, right? They're, they're getting into the NPS game. And what I would say is this, 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 is a tr this is a really tricky one, okay? It's really tricky. I think as a bank, you look, at, you look out there and, and NPS is going to be, you know, for those who don't know, net, the net promoter score system, how likely are you to recommend our products or services to a friend or family member? It's that it's, they, literally there's a book called The Ultimate Question and it, it traces back to that single question. There have been more books written about the limitations of that, the limitations <laughs> of just asking one question, right? And I think that more than anything else, you have to measure something. You have to, you have, to have some standard that you're working from. It allows you to set the bar for yourself. It allows you to compare yourself to your peer set. And I think in the banking space, NPS or, or customer satisfaction, CSAT, will probably be the two biggest standards, probably NPS. So um, you need to be at, the, at a foundational level, you need to be understanding from your customers whether or not they like you and try to pinpoint the things that they like you for, right? What, what has that experience been like for them? What we do with our brand transfer study process and, and the brand transfer score that we develop is really more of a leading indicator of, of NPS, right? There, I, I wouldn't even look at them necessarily as related. It really is more about what can predict whether or not your, your team is going to deliver a great experience and deliver a nine or a 10 on the NPS scale. Um, we're trying to look at it one step further up because by its very nature, NPS is, it is somewhat limited. It's very useful to benchmark yourself. It's very useful to hold yourself accountable, but all the work that goes into making sure you're delivering those nines and tens, man, there's a lot of effort that goes into it for sure. So those listeners who maybe don't have as much experience tracking experience, and that sounds silly, but maybe those that don't, I, I want to kind of frame this up for you to try to help, help those that understand. I'm only going to use a single example on why sometimes the score of NPS can be flawed and what Chris is talking about. If you ask the question to any one of your members or customers out there and they, and they give you a, a, a nine or 10 on your NPS on how likely they are to recommend you, they're looking at the entire ecosystem of what you're looking at, all right? But let's say for example, that I am a member at a credit union and I only have one product with them. Yep. You're getting a flawed metric of me giving and saying, I'm gonna either give you a five or six, which would be a, you know, the sort of passive aggressive area of net promoter. And I'm, I'm saying that I'm less likely to recommend your products to somebody else who maybe has other products that they've had a good experience in. So if you're not actually tracking NPS, specific to the product line, you're not getting accurate measures of truly what your members and customers really feel about your brand. I think you're absolutely right. I think you've highlighted, so there, there, you can do product NPS. There are different sort of iterations of when you send it and how you send it and things like that. It, it can be a very intricate system. I think what you've highlighted, I wouldn't necessarily use the word flaws, more just limitations. Like it's not, sure. it, it doesn't cover everything, right? It's proven to be a really good metric for us to understand who's doing a good job and who's not. But I really do think that to your point, it's the level of commitment that you, that you get into to do NPS completely and, and really cover all the different bases, like what you were just talking about with products. It takes a tremendous amount of, of effort and, and, and frankly, resources. And we've done work with NPS programs and they're a lot of work. I and mean, they, they really are a lot of work to be able to track all of it. 
and um, it's worth the investment, you got to get in the game in general. And I think that one thing I would quick highlight is the difference between transactional NPS and, and relational NPS, which is relational is how do I feel about doing business with you? And transactional is what, how did you feel about our ATM experience? You just used an ATM. What did you think? And it's more of like those individual single touch points. But then again, deploying those, stu- th- those surveys, tracking them. What did we learn? What are we doing? Having somebody who picks up the phone and calls if they had a bad experience. Um, it, it's, it's, you start pulling the thread. And it, and it unravels quickly. And there's, there's a lot to do there. I love it. I love how you just broke that down. Beautiful to it. Chris, I want to talk about a little, a little bit about what FIs can do today to manage some of their brand and experience more effectively. What do you think that they can do like right now to start doing this well? I would say is I, I think that they should look to innovate. Um, and I won't just leave that as a blanket statement. I, I really think they need to look at innovation around where human and digital meet. I'll give you a couple of examples. We're a huge believers at Interview Group and work that we do with frontline teams across all sorts of industries and big brands, and including, including financial institutions. And we are big believers that uh, virtual consultations, what we're doing right now has been a gap in the market. And I think it's a big opportunity, especially in the small business banking. Um, I think that it's a big opportunity for uh, the relationship managers, relationship bankers to be checking in, having a more personal connection. This is more personal than a phone call. It's more personal than calling a call center. Um, having that, that more personal uh, connection is, uh, we, we think is a great opportunity. So, and again, that's digital technology enabling a more human experience. I'm gonna give you one other example. Um, there's a bank out of the Pacific Northwest called Umqua Bank. I don't know if you've ever heard of Umqua Bank. Um, they have a service that is um, essentially when you wanna go seek input from one of their professionals or rather than calling a call center, they have a a chat to call function and you actually can go on. And before you start your chat, they have profiles of the financial professionals that are available to help you. It's, it's, I jokingly call it, it's like match.com meets banking. It's, you go on and you select the person in the profile that you think is gonna meet your needs or has the expertise for what you're looking for, the questions that you have. And it's digital, but it's human, right? It's, 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 it's the convergence of those two things. And so I, I would say, and I know that this is a big answer, but I would say really looking at the, the, the connection points of human and digital and looking for ways to innovate and, and, and have those be human first and digitally enabled, I think is going to drive a much better connection with the customers, that's ultimately what you're looking for. You want a better connection, you want a better relationship, and you want to grow that relationship, right? You want share of wallet. That's what banks are in it for. They want to make money too. But I think that looking at ways to to bring that human element into it and not just focus on put it online, put it online, but looking at the convergence is what I would say is my top recommendation. Love it. We actually have a customer who did something similar. They're our bank and I think we we actually did an episode about it not too long ago. Um, we had their their uh, head of marketing on, and and she was talking about how they've kind of tried to humanize their their loan officers in a very similar way. And I love it. I love that kind of stuff. Like we have to do more of that because that's what ultimately people want. All right. So we've talked about brand and experience coming together. We've talked about you know what it means in each area, how to measure it. We've even talked about some steps that you can take to do it. Who should own it? You talked about brand and and customer experience coming together. I mean, the way we look at it, I I believe that marketing owns the customer relationship. I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. I I think customer experience should, it should either be, there should either be a C-level chief customer officer or chief experience officer or, or it sits in marketing and reports to the CMO. That, that's, my, that's my quick take on it. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, here's the thing. Marketers have more data than anyone on consumers, customers, members, however you would like to reference your base that you're going after. No matter what, there's no other way to look at it. Um, and because of that, all that data can help empower the experience to be more efficient, uh, more effective. And on top of that, it can make wow moments that happen that are more human. Can I give you a great stat? 
I'm going to give you a really good stat here. Okay. And I'm, I'm kind of a stats nerd. Okay. We did some research. Okay. And we found that the, and this is across a variety of consumer facing industries. Okay. We talked to frontline teams and we found that um, marketers are, are infrequently sharing the data that they have with their teams, right? With, with the people who serve the cr- customers rarely see the data that marketers have about what customers want or what their preferences are. They rarely see that, okay? I totally believe that. For the, for the frontline teams that have, are regularly being, having that data and that information shared with them, those frontline teams are twice as likely to feel confident in the experience that they deliver the consumer than ones that do not get that data. So think about that. It goes back to the argument of it should sit marketing. Marketers have this sort of this full long view of the customer relationship, or they should. And for those that do, if it's too siloed out and they know, well, we know what they want and we're going to focus on attracting them. But if the people who have like, you look at it as they're baiting the hook, but somebody has got to work the reel and, and, and pull them in and get them into the boat at some point. Right. If, if you're not working with the same information and you treat that in a siloed fashion, that's a problem. So I look at it as, I mean, we have data that supports the argument that sharing that information leads to the frontline teams feeling more confident that they know how to serve the customer, they know how to deliver the value proposition and, and, and really meet their needs. And to me, that's where brand promise and brand experience come together is those people believing that they can add value to the customer. Mm, I couldn't agree more. As a matter of fact, I try to not do this very much on the podcast because I try to keep it as high level as we can for with thought leadership, but also value. But that's why we have in our product, we call it the member 360, right? Which is essentially a 360 view of everything that they could ever need, information and data. And that's why we, we have that. Because we have found that if marketers and and really anyone who has a growth measure at an organization, if they think about the frontline staff as a channel, changes the game. Like they're also a channel, channel for growth, a channel for growing the opportunities and the relationships that you already have with people. They're they're an opportunity for you to do that. And if, if you're in marketing and you're not sharing that stuff with your frontline staff, Figure out how to do it as quickly as you possibly can, because it is a game-changing op- option for people. I have a, an, a running list of blog posts. One of the, the titles that I have is Frontlines are a Channel. And I, I love that idea. And we talk about that all the time. We talk about what we do as an organization. We're, we're a channel engagement company. And people will oftentimes think of channel as channel partners, external, third party, resellers, and things like that. We look at it and say, any channel that sells for you is a channel, right? You have to engage them you have to sell to them too, right? Let's just be honest. That's what it is. Sell to them too, because the ability to turn it around, have them deliver a confident experience. Yeah. You want them to feel good about what they deliver the customer, share the data with them, ask them what they think, ask them what they see, turn. And and I'm going to do the same thing. I mean, a little bit of a plug for our brand transfer study process is we look at the data set that the marketers have, what they know about the customer. And we say, That is incomplete. That data set is incomplete if you don't know what the view from the trenches is. If you're not asking the people who are in the trenches serving your customers every single day what their point of view is, what they see from customers, you know, we talk about the say do gap, what customers say in a focus group versus what they do when they show up to the to the branch, right? To the branch office, those are those can be two different things. Asking the teams in the trenches what they see and adding that into your data set we think is really critical for marketers today. Mm, Love that piece too, because I I think that's a a big piece that people are missing. So let's talk about the role that technology plays in this. Does it play a role? One. And if it does, what role does it play? We may need to do a separate podcast on this. This is, I mean, this is the, (laughs) this is, this is the big topic. I would, so I'm truly coming around to the point of view that technology plays a role in everything. Okay. Technology plays a role in everything. Technology is the enabler, it is the backbone to pretty much everything we're doing, right? Even when you think about the branch experience and things like that, how they find the branch, how they, there, there's all sorts of things that, all sorts of technology that goes into enabling that experience. But I'll go back to your question earlier about what's the number one thing that you can be doing. It's looking for the crossover points, the, the human crossover points with digital, right? Long story longer, 
Technology needs to play a huge role, but I look at it as an enabler, right? It's, it's not a replacement for, it doesn't drive the entire experience. It is the backbone on which the experience rests. So I do believe technology can make things more human. And again, a case in point is what we're doing right now. If we didn't have the video, we wouldn't be seeing the body language. We wouldn't have as much of a connection. So this technology has allowed us to make things more human, but it's still human. We're still two people having a conversation. Couldn't agree more. I, I, actually, I have often said that exact phrase that it becomes an enabler more than anything. It's not a replacement. And I think that there's so many people that get worried that it's going to replace. When you throw all the AI in the world at something, it's just not going to do it. I don't care how sophisticated it gets, like there's always going to need to be a human because there's going to be a human out there on the other end that is going to want that human connection. And as long as that want and desire is there by us as humans, which will always be there, it's never going to go away. I talked to somebody earlier today that was in the insurance business. And I don't have an exact stat or anything from that conversation, but she brought up something. She was talking about a conversation with her sales team. And um, they were doing a, a rundown on insights from their open enrollment season. And one of the insights that they came up with was nobody went to the portal. Like not nobody, but like a much lower percentage of people went to the portal and went through the step-by-step -step process. You can get to the point where you are just oversaturated with technology. You're, you're oversaturated with prompts and portals and logins and, and all of the things that come along with it. At some point, you want to just call, pick up the phone and say, is this prescription covered? Great. Sign me up for it, right? Uh -huh. This procedure, I have this condition. Is that covered? Like, like, rather than going through all the prompts, I know it's designed to make life easier, but it can be overwhelming. So I, would, I think that's probably my biggest caution as it relates to technology. And, and um, I, I jokingly say to bankers, I've said this in, in recent sessions to bankers, that if your CTO is the one running your customer experience strategy, you've got a problem. Like that is bad if your CTO is running your customer experience strategy because it shouldn't originate from that side of the house. People can get overloaded with technology and it can dominate. In a lot of cases, it causes confusion, even for younger people. The misconception is that it's older demographics. It can cause a lot of confusion and frustration for younger demographics as well. Exactly, because the younger demographics is expecting seamless and when they can approach a human when, when on their time and when it's convenient for them, no doubt. Um, Chris, we're, we're about at time, but I always like to end the podcast by asking a question that kind of keeps us all human. If you could change the world with one thing, what would you do? For me, that's pretty simple. I think that hunger is, especially in the United States, it, it like, it's, a sh it's just a shame on our country. Um, the fact that there are hungry people in this country. Here in the Philadelphia area, one in five children are, are food insecure. So we've got plenty of money to do it. The, the will is not there. And, and when I think about everything else, all the other problems that we have to tackle, literally the most basic necessity we have as humans is nourishment. And magic wand, I would, I would, I would do away with food insecurity. Chris, where can the audience reach you and learn a little bit more about interview? So the uh, best way to reach me is, um, I always encourage people, um, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. Um, I'm always there doing thought leadership, posting stuff, sharing stuff that we find interesting. Chris Wallace uh, with Interview Group. In Philadelphia, there's a lot of Chris Wallaces, so look for Philadelphia and look for Interview Group. Website, interviewgroup.com, and it's I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W, not an interview like we're doing right now, but taking an interview of your brand. So interviewgroup.com. My email is cwallace at interviewgroup.com. And uh, finally, one last thing I'll throw out is brandtransferstudy.com. Take a look at our process, right? We look at frontline insights are a missing metric. There's missing insights that organizations, especially marketers, are not getting from their people who are serving the customers every day. So we detail that process in our proprietary tool on brandtransferstudy.com. Love it, Chris. Thank you so much for joining the podcast today. 